Hello, good morning. Jay the Rio, helping companies do business in Latin America. We appreciate having you here with us today. My name is Cynthia Yanez and I will be your host along with Leonardo Gomez. Hi, good morning, everyone. We would like to remind you that due to the time of this webinar, this is a summarized explanation on the subject and therefore we will have to leave out a lot of interesting information. So in case you have specific questions, please do not hesitate to contact us so we can help you in any deeper way on this matter. Before we begin, we will appreciate if, if you could answer the following questions for us. There should appear a small survey on your, on your screen. Okay, thank you for helping us answer these small questions. Now we will begin into the subject of this webinar, which is electronic invoice CFDI for receipt payment. So we will begin with the agenda for, for this meeting, and we will be talking about the chronolog chronological timing for the obligations to issue um, CFDIs for payments received or complement with for received payments. We will also be talking about uh, the current regulation regarding this, this obligation that has already existed in the, in the Mexican laws for quite a while and why it is taking so much importance. We will be talking about electronic invoice that it's used to support the payments received. What are the options that we have to comply with this obligation and the terms or timings that the taxpayers have in order to issue the electronic invoice. We are going to talk about electronic invoice uh, in, in a more exact way regarding complement for payments received, as well as the CFDI in the version 3.3 .3 for Annex 20 that it's used to comply with the payments received for the taxpayers, as well as the most common mistakes or bad practices that we have noticed during the issues of electronic invoicing. So in order to start with the presentation, we're, we would like to make reference to this chronological line and I would like to give you some feedback regarding this obligation. And uh, most of you should know that before the year 2010, the way in which taxpayers will issue uh, the receipt or invoice for the transactions that are being performed was through pre-printed vouchers. In this case, taxpayers should have an authorized printer that will only allow a serial number for you to have pre-printed forms. In case you were out of these pre-printed forms, you will need to request to the authorized printer for them to give you more serial numbers so you can continue to issue invoices to your customers. However, after 2010, uh, there was the option for taxpayers to transfer to electronic invoicing. So from 2012 until 2000, I'm sorry, from 2010 until 2012, there was these combined versions for pre-printed forms and electronic invoicing. But starting uh, January 1st, 2012, we're obligated to issue uh, in this case, there was a CFD that was the one that we are using right now. So as of this moment, all of the taxpayers were obligated to use a sort of electronic invoicing. In 2014, uh, we moved to our current form of electronic invoicing, which is the CFDI in the version 3.2 which was a more complex version that covered more, more detail for the authority for them to make tax review for the taxpayers. Uh, this version is the one that was available until December 2017. Because starting January 1st, 2018, we are moving to the CFDI 
in its version 3.3, which is the one that all taxpayers are, are obligated to use from January 1st and forward. Uh, and it's the one that will give us the material for this webinar that we will be talking about. Thank you, Cynthia, for that uh, kind uh, introduction for our seminar web webinar session this time. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the obligation to this for client, but the most important thing, it will be about the other obligation, which is related to issue electronic invoice whenever you receive payments from your clients. So uh, in order to move forward, we're going to go to the next slide where we can find the legal support. As you may see, it's established in Article 29A, Section 7, Clause A, which in general terms of the Federal Tax Code, which says that there is an obligation to issue electronic invoice to all of our clients whenever you carry out transactions with them. And it is important that at that time, the electronic invoice is described or breaks down the amount of taxes as well, uh, as well the tax rates for each one of them and the value of the operations. So those are like the common regular electronic invoices that we usually bill to our clients. We're all very familiar with them. There has been no like major changes in that part. However, the same article, but now in clause B, specifically mentions that when you carried out a transaction and the transaction is not paid in a single exhibition or it's paid afterwards, after you bill to your clients, then you will be obligated to bill to your client subsequent invoices related to the, to, for the deposits that you receive or the collections that you made. The same disposition mentions that in that electronic invoice, you need to include the folio of the number of the electronic invoice issued for the total of the operation, as well the total of the amount of the taxes will help and the tra transfer taxes breaking out by the taxes rate, as I already mentioned. So those are the three main requirements that your electronic invoices, whenever you receive a collection, needs to include when you give to your client. However, this same article mentions that it, this article mentions the obligation in general that you're meant to file or, I'm sorry, to issue these electronic invoices. However, Rule 27135 of the miscellaneous tax resolution specifically clears out how you're going to do it. So this miscellaneous tax resolution mentions two alternatives or two possible situations in which you're going to be electronic invoices for collections of payments, which the first one is related when you carried out a transactions with subsequent payments. So for example, uh, let's say that you carried out a transactions with one of your clients worth for $1,000 and you agreed since the beginning that it will be paid in four installments, each one worth of 20, 250 each. So you're meant to file or to issue first a whole invoice for the, for the $1,000 of your bill and then later on, for every installment that you collect, in this case, for every $250 of these transactions, you will issue one electronic invoice for each deposit that you receive. The other a scenario that contemplates the fact that you taxpayers will be obligated to issue electronic invoice whenever they make collections is that it doesn't matter if the payment is carried out in one exhibition, but if the payment is not received at the moment when you bill it to your client, so you give a credit line for 10 days, even though it will be in one exhibition, again, you will be obligated to issue a second electronic invoice. The first one for the full operation and the second one for the first or the whole exhibition that you will collect later on. So in general terms, we could say that the only taxpayers will not, that will not fit into this definition of issuing a second invoice for collections received later on would be uh, stores like they sell to general public. 
So, for example, if you go to Walmart or if you go to uh, Macy's or to any other store, you usually per pay for your merchandise before you leave the, the store. So in those cases, Walmart or those store or those taxpayers will not be obligated to issue a second electronic invoice because at the moment when you pay, they are billing you or they are issuing the electronic invoice for you. Please keep in mind that in order not to make subsequent uh, CFDIs for payments received, you will have to receive the payment before the issuance of the first VI for the total of the transaction, or you should receive payment at the moment when you are issuing the CFDI for the total of the transaction. If payment is received at a later date, as soon as the day after you issue the invoice for the total of the transaction, then you will be in the scenario that Leonardo mentions that you will have to make some CFDI to cover the payments received. It, it is important to mention that these additional CFDI uh, are not precisely a CFDI for sales. And, and let me try to explain this part. Nowadays, there are three types of electronic invoices. One for sales, one for credit notes, we could call it that way, technically. And there is another one for transfer of merchandise. So the first one that you build for the first sale will be the one for the sales electronic invoice. And the subsequent installments that you have to build to your clients, even though they will be a sales electronic invoice, you need to add a complement of payment. This complement, it's additional information that will be within the same electronic invoice that will contain a specific data that the government wants to look for. So for in the same example I mentioned, imagine that you make a sale worth for $1,000 and you're meant to collect it only in one installment 10 days later on. So you will need to issue a first invoice for your same $1,000 and the second invoice, it's important to mention here that you will bill it with zero value, but including the complement of payment, which is additional information that you will include in that second invoice, where at that point, you will describe the folio of the electronic invoice of the first transaction, where you will describe the value of the amount paid, where you will describe the value of the amounts of taxes that you collected, et cetera. So what I'm trying to say in here is that you will not double your revenues because even though you might aim or it might seem that you're issuing two, two invoices for one operation, the first invoices will cover the revenue and the second will only contain information as additional information that the government will request. And now the, the reason why I mentioned this is because this rule of the miscellaneous tax resolution specify what will be the information that you will put into the complement of payment. However, the seven transitory article of the same miscellaneous tax resolution specify that you may choose to issue an electronic invoice, meaning the first invoice of revenue, but without incorporating the complement of receipt of payments. So you will be issuing a second invoice, like technically as a revenue, but without including all the detailed information that we mentioned, such as the folio of the first invoice, the amount of the invoice that was covered, etc. Okay, so in, in this case, the miscellaneous tax resolution says in uh, rule 2718 that the way to elaborate this electronic invoices, you need to look for the guides or for the guidelines that the government provided in its website. You, you will not find a way to issue these electronic invoices, nor in the income tax law, nor in the federal tax code, nor in, in, in a very high level domestic law, but you will find them in a special rules that the government issues or publishes, which are these guidelines that the government will, will publish. And once the government publish, it is an obligation to, to uh, stick to them to start using them at least 30 days once they have been published.
thing to consider is that these mentioned guidelines are not published on the Federal Official Gazette and are not published either on the, on the main site of the tax authority. So if you want to find these guidelines, you need to make a specific search for them. So it's, it's really hard for taxpayers to be up to date with these guidelines. This is a publication in the website of the government, which we took the liberty of making a quick translation that you will find on the next slide. You will find it in this one, which in general terms says that, hey, if, hey, ta taxpayers, please consider that you will not be obligated to issue the complement of payment for every installment that you receive until August the 30th. However, however, you can still instead continue issuing your invoice of elect your electronic invoice for the collections that you made like you used to do it in the past it, it, it's important to mention that this obligation of issuing electronic invoices for installments collected it's not new it, it it's a, it, it's true that the government is trying to make it easier the way to issue these new or these electronic invoices collect for collections. However, the, the government has not been ready yet, and that is the reason why they have given some extensions to taxpayers, so they have more time to comply with it. However, in the meantime, it doesn't mean that you will not be issuing electronic invoices like you used to do it in the past but without the facilities or without, without the easiest uh, or the regulations that the government is giving for the complement of payments. Okay, so in order to get deeper into the subject regarding what Liam mentioned, so whenever a taxpayer receives a payment on a later date after the, the issuance of the invoice for the total sale, they will be obligated to issue a subsequent document. So the options to comply with these obligations are two. One of them, uh, which is the, the one that you can see at the top, is to issue a CFDI that includes the complements for payments received. So this is what it will, the obligation that will be in the future but nowadays it's been postponed until uh, August 31st, 2018. So what it means is that September 1st, 2018, every, every taxpayer should comply with the issuance of the CFDI for payments received using the complement after that date. So what will include using a CFDI uh, with the complement for payments received, Leonardo will let you know in a few screens uh, later on. Uh, however, the second option is to issue a CFDI, which is the regular type that we already know and does not include the complement of payments. So this will be the old fashioned way to comply given the fact that the authority has granted this extension until September 1st, 2018. However, there are a couple of considerations to take in case you want to issue a CFDI uh, as regular type for a regular sale, which will be that on the CFDI, the taxpayers should identify which is the case why they're having to issue subsequent CFDI. Uh, it, depending on the catalogs that the authority has released through any of electronic invoicing, code 08 means that the invoice will be paid in several installments. This will be one of the reasons. And then code 09 will be to indicate that the full invoice will be paid on a later date when the first sale 
was issued. So this is the two ways that taxpayers have to choose from in order to comply with this regulation. How a company will choose for the complement or will choose for the regular type invoice specifying code 08 or code 09 will depend on the activity of the company. It will depend on, on how you're able to control uh, the payments that are received from your customers or your admin capability to, to process these, these several CFDIs. So there's no, there's no right or wrong. Both of them are available options. It will depend on you which one you choose to comply. Another important item before deciding which way you would like to go to comply with this obligation is to consider that if you want to go with using the CFDI, including the complement for payments, you have the possibility to issue one CFDI with the complement for payments uh, that includes the totality of the payments received per customer uh, during the 10th uh, day of the following month uh, at the latest. So this could be considered as a benefit because if a customer is making 10 installments, you are only obligated to issue one CFDI with 10 complements for payment, but just on one date. And it can, it could be up to the 10 day of the following month when the payments have been received. On the contrary, if you want to use a CFDI uh, for regular type in order to comply with this obligation, this CFDI, according to the federal tax code regulations, have to be issued within the next 24 hours after the payment has been received. So this, of course, will be more transparent because you're, you're uh, issuing one, one CFDI per payment received. However, the complication is that you will find yourself in a lot of administrative work trying to comply with this regulation. So um, what are the technical differences between a CFDI with complement for payments, which is the new West and will be our final way to comply versus how a regular invoice or regular CFDI look like? Leonardo is going to talk about how the difference look like. So for the complement of payments, please remember this is the newest form and what the authority is trying to implement, it looks like this. Thank you, Cynthia. And, and just to make a quick parenthesis, we, we have been receiving a couple of questions. Feel free to, to keep shooting questions as, as you may uh, have them. Uh, we, we will wait until the end to try to cover as much questions as possible. However, in case we do not are able because of the time to answer all of your questions at the end. Please uh, be sure that we will answer them by email separately. So feel free to, to make your questions. Moving forward with the presentation, uh, as, as Cynthia was mentioning, at, at this point, it seems to be that there are two ways to comply with the obligation of issuing your electronic invoice whenever you receive collections from your clients. So the first alternative would be, as, as you already know, to issue the complement of payment which would be what you are looking right now in the screen, which in the above part or in the upper part, you can see the information related to the sale, it's specifically like to the information of the invoice of the sale. And on the lower part, below where it says co payment complement in blue color, you can find, as I was explaining priorly, like all the information that details the payment that you're making or that you're receiving in this case. You may see the information that needs to contain 
the printed version of the CFDI version 3.3 for installments collected is the type of receipt we will put in there P as a payment. We will use the code P01, which is like pending to define. We will use the currency triple X because we are not trying to double the sale as I was mentioned at the beginning. This, remember, is the second invoice that you will issue. But in order to be very clear for the government that it is not a sale again, that is the reason why in the unit value, in the subtotal and the total, you type the amount zero. Because again, it is not a sale what the government tries to pursue with the issuing of this new or additional invoice. But what the government tries to pursue is the information of the complement, what is below in here. So in, in general terms, this is the way a second invoice of complement of payment would look like, where at the, at the upper part, in quantity it's zero, in unit of measurement it's the code ACT, the description, it's payment, the product service code, it's the one that appears in there, 8411-1506. And those, and those items will never be modified. Those are meant to be put like that, most of the times like as they are stated in there. However, the information, the one related to payment complement contains a description of the payment, such as the currency, the payment date, the method of payment, the amount that was collected, the name of the institution of the bank where the money is coming from, the tax ID of the person who is making us the payment and so on. So this is the information that the government wants to see in that second invoice when we choose the alternative to go for the complement of payment. There is other information as well important in this, which is almost at the bottom where it says related document and it appears a number in there, which is W-I-D-R-D. So what well, that number means, it's that is the folio given by the government for your first invoice that was for the, for the real or that uh, was for the initial transaction. So that is the information that you need to type in so the government recognizes and matches that the second invoice relates to the first one. One important uh, comment about this complement for payment, it's at the very bottom and it's what the authorities are trying to control or to track with these complements is that it says uh, previous balance amount and you have uh, the peso amount that's at outstanding receivable balance and then you have the amount paid. In this case, you can see that the taxpayer, it's, it's covering the totality of the balance because at the end, to the right, it says unpaid balance amount and it's zero. So this is the important part about the complement for payment, that you're going to have this part per each of the installments. In this example, the taxpayer it's covering the totality of the remaining balance. What happens if we, if our company is not ready for issuing the complement of payments, which again, there is an extension from the government. You are not obligated to comply with the obligation of issuing your invoices with the complement of payment. But as we mentioned priorly, and you are meant to file or to go for the second route or the other alternative, which is, the issuing directly of an invoice version 3.3, which as, as you may see in this in the screen, it's information related to the invoice, but does not contain the information as we saw in the prior slide. The one that was contained below where, where show the description and the balance of the payments and the balance of the uh, account, etc. So there is there are various questions to answer if you decide to go for route number two. So for example, what code should you indicate in the use of the CFDI when this invoice covers payments? Well, it's a question indeed that needs to be made. We have specifications as to how to fill out the complement for payment. 
but these same specifications are not made when you comply through your general CFDI. So we are will be obligated to feel to the best of the of their capabilities, but it's not written or any guidelines. Correct. And uh, what I, what I was going to make is that nowadays version 3.3 of the electronic invoices already has a template, a standard template that you cannot modify. And it requests various information as you are watching right now in the screen, such as the CFD use, the single payments or installment. Uh, there is as well like uh, the payment method exchange rate, the quantity, the measure of unit, which as I mentioned, it is in the template. However, there are no guidelines in how you need to fill it in the information if you decide to go for that route. I mean, it, it seems to be that the government wants you to take this route if you're not ready to issue the complement of payments. However, there, the rules are not very clear on how you will need to fill the information if you take route number two. So for example, there is another question in there what code should you indicate in the payment method when this invoice covers payment? It's unknown. There are no specific rules. Or guess is that you would need to put the closest information or the most uh, accurate information that you have so far. However, there is no specific rules or uh, points that you need to, to consider on how to fill it in. As there are guidelines in the complement of payments, but not in this second scenario. So for example, in the part of the exchange rate, what would you put in there? What should you put in there if this, there, there are no guidelines in terms of the, the exact exchange rate that you should use? The, the question may be, should I use the exchange rate for the, the sale, the initial CFDI for the total of the transaction? or should we use the exchange rate for each of the installment? Uh, that remains unknown. Uh, we will recommend in this case to use the exchange rate for the, each of the installments. Also for items four, five, six, and seven, we will recommend to fill it the same way as you will fill out the complement for payments and that is specified as for product uh, unit of measurement. Uh, we will include the letters ACT for activities and description, we will include payment and for product or for service code number seven, we will use the one that is used in the complement that will be 8411-1506 that's used to indicate that you're receiving installments for the payment. So as you know, through all these scenarios, uh, there's still some uncertainty on how to fill out specifically um, the CFDI when you're trying to comply with this new CFDI per installment. So the authority has issued like an extended period or amnesty in order to, when they found errors on the unit of measure and the product code. And it says that when the taxpayers register a unit of measure or a specific code or service that does not really correspond to the activity that is being performed, it will not incur into any infraction for tax regulations as long as they include on the description field, which is uh, it's available for typing the information freely. It's not, a, it's not a catalog. You type whatever you need. So as long as in this description, you detail the activity to the best of your ability, this is this is the the field that will remain over the code that's been selected. So, however, this period 
it's available on to June 30, 2018. So in this meantime, it's recommended for taxpayers to really search into the catalog for products or service and unit of measures to see what really what really fits their transactions. So when this grace period is over, they're ready to comply according to the transactions that they are performing. And, and I think that the main reason why the government implemented this, uh, this position it, it's because they already know for sure that there are a lot of changes, that there is a lot of uncertainty about you. I might think that my operation or my product, it's whatever. And my client might think that my product, it should be cataloged differently. So I think the government is giving this a specific time for you to coordinate with your clients uh, to make sure that both are in agreement with the description of the of the code of the products, the unit of measurement, and a small detail like that. So you do not get penalty and take this time as a free free trial. Like you, you can make trials in this time without any penalty. So I think it's a good thing that we have this position currently available. Leading to the last part of our of our webinar today, and we would like to point out some common mis mistakes or bad practices that we have noticed uh, during the issu issuance of the electronic invoicing. So one of the most common mistakes or inconsistencies will be that in a CFDI, form of payment is indicated as payment in installments or deferred. This will mean that the transaction will be paid on a later date, but the inconsistency will be to indicate that it's paid through electronic funds transfer. So by this, you're indicated that you know the payment, it's been electronic uh, funds transfer. So if you're saying that it's a deferred payment, how will you know that it already occurred in electronic funds transfer. So this is uh, an inconsistency that the authorities would probably reject. Same way, uh, the second scenario is that you say that the payment occurred in one installment, but when you want to specify the payment method, the taxpayer includes to be defined. This is also another inconsistency because if you're specifying that the payment already occurred or occurred at the moment when you issued the CFDI, then in that case, you should have been able to include the correct method of payment, such as, ca such as cash, debit card, wire transfer, etc. So the correct examples will be the last two that have a green check example if the partial, if, if it's a, a payment in installment or a payment that's deferred, then the payment method is to be defined. You can have a promise from your customer saying that they will pay in wire transfer or in credit card, but at the moment, the method of payment is to be defined. So this is how we should be issuing the CFDI with a complement of payment. And then the second case is that if the pay, if we specify that the payment is in one installment, then we should be able to indicate the, the actual method of payment, in this case, electronic funds transfer, wire transfer, uh, cash, whatever it was. So <clears throat> other bad practices that we have noticed or heard from some of our customers is that some, some suppliers request more than your tax ID in order to issue an invoice to the company. So uh, this has been one of the newest uh, changes in the regulation. So in the past, in order to issue an invoice, you were obligated to provide to the supplier a lot of companies information, but right now, the only obligation is to provide the tax ID. So 
whenever you're facing uh, with a supplier that is requesting a lot of information, please keep in mind that the only information that you are obligated to provide is a tax ID. And with that information, they should be able to produce a CFDI to your customer. Another bad practice, and that's that could occur on small businesses, uh, is that they increase the cost of the product or service when an invoice is requested. Uh, that if you don't require an invoice, then the cost is 100 pesos. And if you require an invoice, it's 116. So this is a bad practice. And if we identify a supplier with this trend, we should avoid working with them and maybe finding a supplier that doesn't have this type of practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's important to mention that the practices that we're, we're showing you here, it, it's not something that, it, it, besides the fact that it's something that we have seen in the practice, in the day-to-day -day transactions, it's something that the government already noticed and the government already identifies. And as you may see at the bottom of the slide, you can find the link of the website of the government where they really publish this uh suggestions and bad or or mentions that these will be considered bad practices and encourage taxpayers as cynthia was mentioning to avoid doing uh business with them to avoid uh providing additional information that is not necessary and then the main reason to do so is to try to have uh taxpayers that really complies with current tax regulations i would like to point out a uh, practice in number four which is denying the issues of the CFDI because it was not requested at the moment that the transaction occurred. So it is possible to, to issue an invoice on a later date. So please consider that whenever a supplier does not want to issue an invoice on a later date. And also number seven, which is not issuing the invoice when advance payments are received, this is a new, a new obligation of version 3.3 of the CFDI. So every time you make an advance payment to your supplier, you should be you should receive a CFDI uh, for this advance payment. Now, what are the consequences of if the electronic invoices are not issued or are issued but did not comply? with the totality of the tax requirements. So what the authority has established in the federal tax code is that the expenses uh, supported with this documentation may not be deducted for tax purposes or the VAT may not be credited. So this is a significant uh, consequence of not complying with CFDI obligations besides the fact that there is a penalty shown on the second paragraph of to 13,570 pesos up to 77,000 pesos for not complying with issuing the CFDIs. And, and it is worth to mention that the penalties are for both parts. So if you're issuing an invoice incorrectly, you might only fit into the penalty of of the sanction of the 13,000 pesos up to the 77,000. But to your client, the problem that you could cause him is that he might not be able to deduct your invoice as an expense for him, nor to credit the VAT that he already paid you. So it might be you, you have problems for your clients and vice versa. When you receive invoices from your suppliers, it's important for you to review them because if you, if if you do not assure that your supplier bills you correctly, you might fit into the consequences of bullet number one, which might be the fact that you might not be able to deduct for income tax purposes, nor to credit the VAT. Now, before we begin our question and answer segment, we have one last question as a survey that will appear in your screen. We will appreciate if you could help us with your answer. Thank you. Please remember that you can find this webinar in our YouTube channel on Monday. 
Please subscribe to our channel as we will be uploading re relevant information on tax and labor issues as soon as they become available. Thank you very much for taking some time for us. It is important to know your opinion. We will start now our question and answer section. We will try to answer most of your doubts within this session. However, if some of your questions are left without an answer, we will be contacting you directly to solve them. So please feel free to type any questions you may have. So, uh, Cynthia, the, the first question that I have in here, uh, it says uh, it is related to the complement of payment. And it, it is very clear and it says, uh, since when you are obligated or taxpayers are obligated to issue the CFDI with the complement of payments? With the complement of payments, the authority has granted an extension and the complement of payment is mandatory starting September 1st, 2018. In the meantime, you can choose to comply through the complement of payment or through the regular form of the CS CFDI, which is the two options that we discuss during this webinar. Okay. <clears throat> there is another question in here that says, uh, if I make a payment to my supplier, am I obligated to ask my supplier to so he can issue me the CFDA for payment? In theory, you should not have to ask for, to your supplier to issue the CFDI. However, in case you do not receive it from your supplier, you have to request them because as we have seen through this webinar and past webinars, the CFDI is the document that supports tax deductions and VAT credits. So in case you do not receive this from your suppliers, you have to request them to them. So I will read another question, Leo, if you help me answer them. Sure. Uh, it says, on the, on, the, on the CFDI for the sale, is it necessary to include the, the number of installments on which the, the, it's going to be paid? Thank you, Cynthia. No, in this case, it is not necessary. It is not necessary to put the number of installments that you plan to receive from your client. Uh, if you have the information, you may put it it will be considered like as an additional information, but it is not mandatory. Thank you. Another question it says, if I want to comply through the issuing, issuance of a, C, of a regular CFDI, what is the, the regulation that indicates the time frame of 24 hours to issue the CFDI? Okay. Uh, in this case, the legal uh, regulation, it's on Article 39, of the ruling of the federal tax code so that's where you find the legal support that establishes that you are meant to issue your electronic invoices 24 hours after you receive the collection okay and i think we have time for one last question it says what happens with all the payments from suppliers that occurred from january 1st up to date and I have not issued the CFDI for complement, nor the CFDI for sale. Okay, yeah, well, in, in this case, considering the current disposition, we, we are from the opinion that technically are pending to be issued. So you have two alternatives in here. Uh, you have the alternative to issue the invoice of sale, as we were explaining, which there is a lot of information that it's unknown how to type it or how to put it or fill it in. Or the other alternative is to issue the complement of payment, which again, you're not obligated, but it will take you out for going for route number two. So in, in any tips, at the end of the day, the uh, suggestion or from our point of view, we believe that for those payments received from January up to date, if you have not issued the electronic invoice for those installments, it's pending to be done. Okay, thank you, Leo, for your answer. On behalf of J. The Rio Helping Companies to America, we would like to thank you for your time within this webinar. 
please remember that we, it will be uploaded on our YouTube on our YouTube channel by Monday, and also information will be sent to your email directly. So in case you have any further questions, you can have our contact information on this presentation. Feel free to send us a note. Thank you very much.